in the waning hours of World War II, the Allies faced a new terror in the skies. It had twin engines, twin machine guns, and flew like nothing they had ever seen before. It was capable of flying faster than traditional planes, impossible to detect on radar, and would prove to be a winning hand for the defense of the Nazi state. But this alternative history never happened. The Ho-229 was a radical departure from modern aircraft design, and had it been rolled out, could have changed the outcome of the war, the way we design planes today, and even lead to something far more sinister. This is the original flying wing, the Horton 229. Since the dawn of aviation, one thing has been a dream concept for aircraft designers, a flying wing. This is an aircraft with no tail and that has no defined fuselage, essentially a wing as the entire aircraft. Crew, payload, fuel and onboard equipment, all of it is housed within the main structure of the wing. Because that's all there is. After all, if you look at a typical aircraft, so much of its volume is wasted on areas that don't generate lift. As BBC Future noted in 2016, the flying wing design is not a common sight in the skies because it's an incredibly hard concept to make work. Remember, the main tail of any aircraft keeps it stable and prevents it from swerving or yawning from side to side. Therefore, a lack of tail makes the aircraft a lot harder to control. Even more of a challenge is what happens to an aircraft without a tail when its engine stops. That is, can it still fly during a stall? The ability to do that is inherent capability that any aircraft has been able to do. So why would you make a flying wing aircraft that is inherently difficult to fly? Because a flying wing has several benefits. For one thing, it is difficult to spot on a radar since it has no tail fins that are what are usually bounce the radar waves back to earth. And for another, a flying wing is sleek and smooth in shape, which means it has minimal drag. That should make it a lot lighter and a lot more efficient than most fighter jets. And lastly, it should theoretically fly faster than a conventional plane using the same engine. The famous Northrop B-2 Spirit Stealth Boa, first released in 1989, is a modern example of a flying wing aircraft. Before that, Northrop was working on a propeller bomber design called the XB-35 and later upgraded to the YB-49 with jet engines. But believe it or not, they were not the first. If you go back more than four decades before the B-2 stealth bomber was launched into the skies, you will have a far earlier plan for a flying wing and a fairly stunning one at that. It was the Ho-229 and it was set to revolutionize the air force of a certain country fighting a certain major war at the time. So let's see, an aircraft with a revolutionary design we've never seen before? Check. Said aircraft developed at the tail end of World War II? Check and under top secret development by a country which had started the war and was starting to lose it by then. Double check. Now, what country could that possibly be and what possibly went wrong with the project? The country, of course, was none other than Nazi Germany. After all, no other country came close to Germany in exploring new and often highly unorthodox aviation designs during World War II. The Ho-229 or Horton HIX was a Nazi prototype fighter bomber whose claim to fame was simple yet powerful. It was the first jet engine powered flying wing. The Horton Ho-229 was initially designed by brothers Riemar and Walter Horton and was to be mass produced at the... Oh, uh, this is going to be a hard one to pronounce guys, so hold on. Guta Wagon Fabrik. Forgive me anybody who speaks or understands German for that horrible pronunciation. Okay, back to the show. Which was why the aircraft was also designated the Gothica Go 229. 
It should be noted that the original concept needed extensive redesign work done by Gothica in order for it to be primed for mass production, but we can't rule out the initial work done by the two designers. Walter and Rema Horton had been designing aircraft since the early 1930s. At the time, Germany was still officially banned from having an air force due to the draconian terms of the Treaty of Versailles, signed after World War I. Sporting air clubs were set up all over Germany to overcome these restrictions by the Nazi party, of which the Horton brothers were a part. It was those air clubs that became the foundation for Nazi Germany's air force, the Luftwaffe. It's been said that Riemar was a brilliant designer and Walter the audacious fighter pilot. Together, they made a formidable team. So how did these two brothers get chosen to design and build these top secret projects by the Nazi high command? They did so by winning a competition. That's right, it was actually Hermann Göring, the head of the Luftwaffe, who in 1943 called for a light bomber design that would be capable of meeting the all-important three times a thousand requirement. That is the ability for the craft to carry 1,000 kilograms or 2,200 pounds of bombs to a distance of 1,000 kilometers at a speed of 1,000 kilometers per hour. And that's 620 miles per hour for both instances. However, only jet engines could provide that type of speed. Furthermore, jets were extremely fuel hungry, which made the range requirement of 1,000 kilometers particularly challenging. The Ho 229 flying wing was the only design submitted to Goring that even came close to the tough 3x1000 requirement that he'd set. And unsurprisingly, the Horton brothers' design was the one to see Goring's final approval. He immediately allocated half a million Reichmarks to the Horton brothers to get several prototypes built and flown as quickly as possible to turn the tide of war currently raging in Europe. The Horton Ho 229 was a sleek number, measuring 7.4 meters in length at its center line with a total wingspan of 16.8 meters. The Horton wing concept addressed the whole engine stall dilemma that afflicts flying wing aircraft by ensuring that the aircraft would keep stable at all times. It achieved this by having a bell-shaped wing that was long and thin, or what is known as a high aspect ratio wing. This design principle meant that the weight of the aircraft would be spread over a greater surface area during a stall or engine cutoff, thus creating greater drag and allowing the aircraft to slow down and be controlled. Controlled. By the way, several decades later, Rima Horton's bell-shaped wing would be called nothing short of genius by Al Boas, a NASA chief scientist at the Neil A. Armstrong Flight Research Center in California. Boas says that the Horton wing not only cancelled out the yawing issues that an aircraft without a wing can suffer, but that it also dramatically reduced drag whilst at speed. The Horton Hose cockpit height was decidedly low at 1.1 meters, although its overall height was 2.81 meters at its apex. Unsurprisingly, this made the space incredibly cramped that it only allowed for one crew member, and even that would be damn tight for that person with their head likely bumping on the top of the canopy. The Ho 229's range was highly impressive, 1,900 kilometers or 1,200 miles. Noteworthy too because it was far in excess of the 1,000 kilometer range demanded by the high command. It also had a flying ceiling of 15,000 meters or 49,000 feet, which was useful in terms of stealth. The Germans didn't really know it at the time, but the British were using a rudimentary radar during the Battle of Britain, and this aircraft would have been highly decisive in those skirmishes across the English Channel. There was also that other speed requirement. The speed capabilities of the Horton Ho 229 were a little bit less impressive. The Flying Wings power plant consisted of two Junkers Jumo 004B turbojet engines with 8.83 kilonewtons of thrust each. That allowed for performance outputs of a maximum speed of 960 kilometers or 600 miles per hour or Mach 0.77 
at sea level. Whilst having an acceleration speed of up to 977 kilometers or 600 miles per hour at its cruising altitude of 12,000 meters or 39,000 feet. And whilst all that jargon does actually sound particularly impressive for World War II, it didn't actually meet that requirement that we mentioned earlier of a thousand kilometers per hour. Even so, it was said to possess a never exceed speed of just 1000 kilometers or 620 miles per hour, which the conspiracy part of me thinks that the designers put it in there to make the head of the Luftwaffe all happy. But then again, perhaps they were impressed by the takeoff speed of 150 kilometers or 93 miles per hour and a climb rate of 22 meters a second or 4,300 feet per minute, which was incredible for the day. In terms of armaments, the Ho 229 was hardly packing, being only able to carry two 30mm machine gun cannons. Nevertheless, the Nazis believed that an entire squadron of them would have been sufficient in what have been their main role, which was to hunt down and shoot the fleets of Allied bombers that were attacking Germany's industrial plants, main infrastructure, and larger cities. By 1945, Germany was being crippled by Allied bombardments and it was thought that the Horton Ho 229 could stop that. And once the industrial capacity of the country was saved, why stop there? Could the Ho 229 technology be scaled up in such a way to take the fight back to England, become the new air superiority fighter, or perhaps even take the fight to the United States itself? Alas, reality made all of these ambitious plans come crashing down. The prototype suffered many technical problems. The only jet-powered example had a successful flight in February of 1945, but crashed in another test a few weeks later due to engine failure, which killed its test pilot. And then there was also the timing. All of the frantic testing was being done in the last few months of World War II, with the Allied forces coming from both the east and west, taking out slowly all of Germany's industrial capacity. In fact, a half-completed prototype, among three other unfinished models, was captured by General George S. Patton's 3rd Army at the end of the war. As with so many examples of cutting-edge revolutionary aviation designs by the Nazis, the Horton Ho 229 was a case of too little, too late. But all was not lost. The Hortons had left the aviation world quite the legacy. The flying wing concept conceived by the Horton brothers no doubt inspired post-war designers in the US. One such aviation designer was Jack Northrope, who had been inspired by the Horton sports gliders of the 1930s, not to mention the Ho 229 captured by Patton and all of his men at the end of World War II. The American designer had been hard at work at the XB-35 flying wing bomber design in the 1940s, which was unsuccessful due to its massive vibration. It proved that the Hortons had been right to use jet engines instead for the Ho 229, and perhaps that bell-shaped flying wing would have solved many of the other stability issues of the XP-35. Of course, I've got a video on these flying wing designs right here on the channel. Of course, it goes without saying that Northrop, that name should ring a bell. It was indeed Northrop's company that would later develop the highly successful B-2 Spirit Stealth Bomber. There is no doubt that Northrop Stealth Bomber designs was inspired by the Horton Ho 229, given how many resemblances are there. Interestingly, the flying wing concept wasn't even entirely that of the Horton brothers. That credit belongs to a German aerospace engineer, Hugo Junkers, that had already painted in a flying wing design back in 1910. The Horton brothers simply took the flying wing concept to another radically modern level. And I think looking at these original designs of 1924 makes me really want to make a video about it. 
Experts believe that the groundbreaking work of the Horton brothers was done much to pave the way for the superior efficiency of aircraft in the near future, with the possibility of improved drag efficiencies of at least 70%, which is a huge deal in the world of aviation. The Horton design also does much to even explain the flight of birds, who, after all, don't need entails in order to fly majestically like the Pelican. But you might be wondering if anything was salvage of the bold Nazi project that came to a sudden halt in the middle of 1945. Today the only surviving Ho 229 airframe, which was the third version of the aircraft or the Ho 229 V3, is housed at the Paul E. Garber Restoration Facility at the Smithsonian Museum in Sutland, Maryland. It had been moved there in 2011 by the National Air and Space Museum so that it could be fully restored. This sole surviving Horton Ho 229 has been on display in the main hall since 2018, alongside other Luftwaffe aircraft from World War II. It is also the only surviving World War II era German jet prototype still in existence. That's one very unique exhibition. It seems that the Ho 229 represented a fork in the road in Nazi plans for world domination. While the program itself might have been too little too late, had it gone on to become hugely successful, it would have paved the way for insanely ambitious plans to create a huge juggernaut with eventual plans to bomb New York. And that, my friends, is actually part two of this tale that you can watch early right now on Patreon or channel memberships. Come find out the various and insane ideas that those Nazis had to take the fight to North America and how the Ho 229 would have been the very foundation for that outrageous and audacious plan to take place. I've put a link in the video description and you can jump in to check it out today. Special thanks to all of those Patreons who have taken the time to support the channel so far and your lovely names are up here on screen. Thanks again so much for watching.